Hello, coaches. My name is Jason Couch. I'm a head football coach at Alma College. Um, I was asked to give a presentation today uh, about kind of my path that I've taken uh, to get to this point where I'm at now. And uh, it's been my pleasure. Been a longtime member of the Michigan High School Football Coaches Association. And uh, as a high school coach uh, for quite a long time uh, before moving to Alma a little over two years ago now. So, um, but certainly my pleasure to uh, share this with you and um, wish I was doing it in person, but uh, um, you know, we're, we're making do with, with what we have. So, as I'm sure you are. Um, please don't hesitate at any time if you have uh, questions to, to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to, to talk ball or uh, talk about Alma College, um, what we have to offer here. So uh, I am very biased. I'm an alum of, of Alma. Um, and so that's kind of what, what brought me home. But uh, as you can see here, kind of my path, which <clears throat> I know if you Google a lot of college coaches, their resume is a lot longer than this. Um, but uh, I certainly learned a lot from each of the stops along the way. And uh, that's what I was asked to present on. And so um, that's what, what you're going to get. So um, I played under Dennis Zabozin at Romeo High School. Romeo is um, a small Division I uh, school and uh, played under him back in the early 90s. And uh, I joke here about, you know, I was a center uh, for Coach Z. Um, he's a mentor of mine. I actually just talked to him this morning, uh, caught up a little bit on how he's doing and in family. And, uh, you know, he's, he's still coaching uh, with Pat Threed over at Lakeview. And uh, they're doing great things there. So, uh, but, you know, I, jokingly, you know, block down, don't screw up. The good old uh, option system and, and, and Z was, uh, he knows so much football, both sides of ball. And, you know, again, uh, I look up to him and what we talked about today um, really was what I did pull from him about uh, doing less, but doing what you do well. And I know that I, as a coach, have gotten away from that too many times, uh, always thinking that more is better. Uh, this will, you know, this does well against uh, certain defenses. And, you know, if we put this in, you know, we'll be better. But if really, it, what is your base? What do you hang your hat on? Because that's what you end up going back to. Um, doing those things very well. So, um, you know, after I graduated from, from Romeo, I, I went on to uh, play at Alma College. I had to mix up a little bit of humor here. That's our kind of a, a, a spoof uh, senior picture. Um, so Coach Cole, uh, who I played under, allowed seniors to do kind of a, a fun little uh, photo. Uh, I was known to put back a few chili dogs in my time, and uh, so my senior picture's there with a, a chili dog. But uh, uh, at Alma College, uh, thankfully, they gave me those oversized pads, so I looked bigger than I actually was. Uh, but I uh, learned a lot, and uh, completely different system uh, than high school. And, um, you know, back, well, actually, when I, when I came to Alma was the first year of the Scott Gun. So it was uh, a completely spread offense, a um, lot of fun. Um, I do, you know, thinking back, I know coaches were uh, thinking of a few things, working out the kinks um, those first couple of years, but, uh, you know, to be innovative and creative, um, that's something I, I learned. But from, from Coach Cole himself, uh, I certainly learned to be true, be genuine. Um, doesn't do you any good to, to um, 
put out a persona that's not yours. And um, I always admired him for for who he is and, and uh, what he's done. Um, not, you know, of course, as a coach, but also as a mentor to myself and to hundreds, well, thousands of other uh, men who, who played for him. Um, so, um, and he still to this day is, is of course, a mentor of mine and um, a big supporter of uh, sports and high school sports and, of course, football. But uh, his son, Scotty Cole, is uh, on staff, uh, was my first phone call uh, when I got this job about coming back home to Alma College. So um, the Scott Gun spread, uh, like I mentioned, it was unique to its time. I, I loved the pace, the tempo. Um, I loved how people kept coming up to us. Uh, you play at Alma, how do you, you know, those splits that they do are, are ridiculous. Uh, how do you do that? You can't do that. And I'm like, oh, we're doing it. Um, but uh, just to give you our splits, <laughs> uh, just thinking in my head as I'm talking about them, kind of fit our quarantine rules of six feet apart at least. There is not a chance that I, being a center, could ever touch the the fingertips of an outstretched arm of a guard. Uh, our splits were uh, that far plus. Um, we became, I mean, we were going to throw the ball a lot, and so we became a, a very good uh, pass protection uh, offensive line. Um, and that's something that I certainly learned there uh, from Coach Brian Zimmerman. You know, if you're going to throw the ball 80% of the time, then you better work on pass protection 80% of your practices. So it's about balancing. What's, what's your thing what you what are you hanging your hat on and making sure you work that uh, a proportionate amount in practice and so um you know that was something that i still to this day as i'm practice planning making sure like okay if we're going to be a power team then if i'm working with tight ends then we better you know heavily work on that kick out block of that defensive end so um, just to give you an example, but um, <clears throat> to bounce around a little bit here, high tempo. Um, one game, I, I know we played 102 uh, plays on offense and, uh, you know, no huddle, and which is common now, but, um, you know, certainly not as much back then. And I had defensive linemen that were literally throwing up in front of us. Um, where you know we would get excited going yes now we know we have them because if a guy's puking then he's probably not going to be as effective as a as a defender um so that kind of stuck with me in terms of um being in shape and running practices because we didn't condition a whole lot as when i was a player at alma uh, our practices were conditioning enough. Um, back then was a little bit different. We certainly had longer practices, and uh, but the tempo of practice was impressive to think back of how many reps we end up getting in in a 10-minute, um, you know, offensive segment. So um, that's kind of stayed with me. And I'll be honest, um, as an offensive coordinator, uh, my goal was always to get that defender throwing up and, uh, you know, to get him so tired that uh, we, we certainly would win the fourth quarter. Um, I thought you had to do that in the spread offense. And um, actually, it wasn't until uh, – I don't think it ever happened where – uh, defender was uh, so tired they're pretty much tapping out um, until 2015 uh, when we started to use at Ro when I was coaching at Romeo and we were using the jet offense uh, where we had a linebacker that 
because of the sideline to sideline running uh, did in fact get, you know, start getting sick right there on the field. Um, so it's not necessarily, again, the spread, but being a conditioned team is, is very important to me. But I think it can be done in practice and tempo more so than just lining up because uh, as a player, I remember, Coach, you know, on occasion we would line up. How much do you save yourself, right? How many sprints are we going to do? And you can say go full, you know, full out, but you can't do eight sprints 100% without, you know, dropping, and that's dangerous now. And so, um, but you, t you tell players, you know, our expectation in practice is each play, you know, you're giving 100% effort and you in and out of huddles if you're huddling. That's where your conditioning is. And I think they buy into that more too is um, they see it as beneficial more so than they would ever see a lineup and condition. And I'm not saying that we never do it. We certainly do, but not um, not if the tempo and practice is where it should be. Um, something else that I learned at, at Elma that I feel um, I still um, try to apply it and um, is asking questions. So as I was a I was a senior. Um, center and I remember at times asking our coaches why are you throwing this pass and it wasn't uh, disrespectful like I wasn't questioning them I just wanted to know because I knew I wanted to go on and be a teacher and a coach myself and so ask why what, what do you mean safeties we got open or closed two eye one eye all that stuff um, I had no idea I just knew block the guy in front of me or uh, um, you know, and so I, as a coach, try to get our player, or excuse me, the other coaches, um, not that you need to, um, on the field, spend 10 minutes explaining why you're doing a drill, but if they, in pre-practice meeting or afterwards even, uh, I like to do it before, understand why they're doing something and how it'll be beneficial, I think then they see the bigger picture. And then they're also more knowledgeable when they come off the field on game day and share with you what they're saying. And then you can help, you know, come up with answers. Um, certainly college, we watched a lot more film uh, than I did in high school. And, uh, you know, the constant uh, back then VHS, the, you know, rewind, and we had to go down, um, you know, we didn't get copies to take back to our, our dorm, dorm rooms. Uh, sometimes we would borrow them and then bring them back. But, um, you know, I found that's when I really learned to study an opponent. And then it was just typically the, the two or three different nose guards that I might face or what's a move that a linebacker uses. Um, and But I did learn to study – you know, I knew guys' moves, and I also knew how they would use them against me, right? And that made me a better player. Um, I knew that, it, you know, a guy's uh, quicker guy, he's going to look for me to be aggressive. So I knew I had to be a little bit more patient in my pass protection, not lunging out after him and, and let him do his, his first move step or two um before I then you know went to engage and, and deliver that you know the punch so um that's what gets also into that that bullet point here of knowing our flaws um I knew I I sometimes was a little too aggressive um I was a little undersized so I tried to deliver the blow to slow somebody down but I also knew that that aggressiveness could be used against me so um, you, I guess, study yourself. Um, and I think as a, as a coordinator, um, we do that uh, a little bit and probably need to do it more is, okay, where, what's our weak link? How can we, you know, make sure that a defense doesn't 
uh, capitalize against us um, and vice versa with the other side of the ball. But uh, so uh, I had a great four years at Alma College and, uh, you know, so much that uh, when offered the job, came back and uh, asked my family to, to leave our hometown uh, for forever. And, uh, you know, we, we've certainly loved being back, but uh, we'll get into that here in a moment. So after um, Alma College, I uh, uh, student taught at Merrill High School, uh, which is about 25 minutes uh, east of Alma. And uh, as I was student teaching, I was offered a, a full-time position. And so I ended up, I was at, at Merrill for two years. Um, as you can see, uh, there hadn't been a whole lot of winning tradition uh, at Merrill. And um, a comfortable part, I did go over with uh, Mel Skillman, who was special teams coordinator at Alma. Mel went over um, the same year as head football coach uh, in 1997. And, uh, you know, you see there, and uh, one and eight was, was certainly uh, not what we were hoping to do. And, um, you know, but there was still some excitement about the program. Um, Coach, uh, you know, brought in the, the spread offense, which was unique to Merrill. Uh, I think it suited the needs um, or desires of the, the students there. They had some success with, with basketball. And so we had to recruit uh, within our school. We had to get, I think our first year there, we had about 18 um, young men that were were playing football and so uh, we really had to entice them to to come out for football um, and uh, you know the second year there five and four holy cow there were basically felt like parades and and things were uh, were exciting and were a lot of fun um, and then of course when I left they really got good and uh, in 1999 went 11 and two so um, but my second year, Coach Skillman asked me to be the defensive coordinator. Um, and uh, thankfully, a friend of mine um, was student teaching from Alma College, a teammate, John Streeter, who was a linebacker at Alma. And uh, I'll be honest, he was the primary defensive coordinator. He, he knew defense um, much better than I did. But it did force me to to learn more about the defensive side of the ball, which I think did it later help me offensively. So um, I've got a couple other resume things. I coached JV baseball, coached volleyball, um, varsity head uh, head coach with Christian Wiley at Merrill. Um, that really helped me in future being a head coach. I had no idea how much paperwork, how much parental contact there was until uh, a head coach. And also coaching um, females is, is quite different, um, how important communication is. And, um, you know, there were many times where we would sit down and have our powwows as a team, but, uh, you know, communicating with them and having them understand what we're doing, why we're doing. Um, really then for me, I took it to the, the football field as well. So um, in, in the, my last bullet there on that slide, bringing the enthusiasm that uh, the community, I think desired so, so much and um, students respond to that. And uh, so, I think we had a, a fairly young staff and and uh, very eager and um, maybe naive at time, but but Mel um, did a great job balancing that and keeping us young coaches in check. And um, you know, but I learned a lot as, for my first year as a coach there. Uh, after Merrill, my goal was to. Uh, to be honest, was to get back to my hometown. I wanted to get back to Romeo to teach and coach. 
Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, nothing at the time where it was open, but I knew that, you know, Troy High School was a phenomenal school, and um, it was an opportunity for me to get closer to uh, family and, and friends. Uh, so my first year, I, it was 1999, and I I uh, was a volunteer as an assistant O-line, D-line coach um, in, in teaching in the building. Um, Gary Griffith uh, was a head coach then, and, um, you know, he, he's got such a, a wealth of knowledge and, um, you know, he had been there for quite a while. Um, the defensive side of the ball is impressive, and um, I remember learning from him that preparation for games, um, how much more I needed to do in terms of film study and coaches meetings, um, but you know, how, how much more I needed to prepare, right? And uh, so we would, I would often um, actually spend the night on his couch at his house on Friday night, wake up Saturday and we'd go into the office and uh, you know, meet as a coaching staff for uh, four, six, seven hours, whatever it would have taken, um, just to get us, ourselves on the same page for um, the next week. So I took that with me as I went back to uh, when I went back to to Romeo, um, and I'll get to that in a moment. But Kurt Rhinus and I, um, you know, we we did it slightly different. Um, Saturdays were typically for uh, family, and then Sundays were kind of our work day. Um, so in the um, late afternoon or evening is when the coaches would get together. So, um, but also at, at Troy, um, love the the power run game that they were known for and good at, um, and also you know the constant let's keep doing this until it's done correctly. Um, almost the, the perfect play, if you'd say. Um, it's not always just about reps, reps, reps. It's about good reps in, in getting it done. How, how can we expect it to be done well on Friday night if it's not done well um, in Tuesday's practice? Um, so uh, I got a call uh, asking if I was ready to come back home. Uh, to Romeo, uh, which I was. And so in 2001, there was a teaching and a coaching position open. And, uh, you know, I, it was exciting to be back um, in the hometown, uh, somewhere where, again, I it was my goal uh, since graduating Alma. But uh, in 2001, I went in as a um, uh, social studies teacher and an assistant coach under Greg Ganfield. Uh, Greg ha was my uh, head JV coach when I played at, at Romeo um, and had been uh, Romeo for 30-some for years before retiring and then going on to coach at several different uh, places. But uh, in, in 2003, um, Greg retired. And at the time, uh, Kurt Rhinus and I, who Kurt and I uh, played baseball and uh, football together. Um, Kurt's two years uh, behind me in grade, but, uh, but a heck of an athlete and ended up playing together in those two sports. And uh, so he and I were both back there teaching and coaching and uh, when the position was open, you know, we, we were both, we both applied for it. Uh, I certainly made it clear that if he got the job, um, I would stay on and, and work, you know, for him. And, and he relayed the same message. So um, that's when we both said, well, you know, I got to believe our goal and our vision for, for Romeo is very similar. And we kind of, uh, shared with each other our philosophy. Our, we had uh, uh, interview booklets kind of made up. And uh, so we finally said, you know, why don't we do this together? We'll be co-ed coaches. 
And so we presented that to um, our athletic director, Greg Breinert, and then principal uh, Gavin Johnson. And I think it, they were probably a little relieved because they, I doubt they really wanted to make that decision of one or the other, um, especially fearing that might lose one. But uh, there was still some, some ap apprehension because back in 2003, there weren't too many examples of co-head coaches. Um, why it worked is the first bullet point there of communication. Uh, Kurt and I uh, talked a ridiculous amount. Uh, we would literally leave the office, let's say 7 p.m. And uh, that's after we had an hour conversation after practice. And we would call each other for our four minute ride home. And I remember it sometimes sitting in the driveway because we're still talking and because I didn't want to walk into the house and be on the phone. Uh, and then other days I would walk in she's, and my wife would be like, are you kidding? You guys are still talking with each other. Um, but that communication had to be that, we had to be that transparent with each other and on the same page. And uh, so that's why it, it worked for as long as it did and uh, continued to work until, you know, I, I accepted this position. Um, one of what I think is a, a huge factor in, in success in a program is cohesiveness within the staff. There were some changes along the way from 2003 um, to 2018, but for the most part, core of the coaching staff was together. And when you don't have to coach coaches, and I don't mean like tell them what to do, I mean like the terminology that you use and um, your culture that you're trying to, to present and to share, when that's there and, and established, um, it's huge because then the, the players are hearing it over and over, but from mo multiple voices, which I think has a greater impact. Um, Kurt and I were both young. Um, I think we, I was 30, he was 27 or something, maybe, maybe even younger than that. Uh, 27, maybe I was anyways, uh, when I was head coach, what I'm getting at is I, it was a learning curve. Um, I think I forgot about some of Coach Zabozin's principles of do a few things well instead of a lot of things just okay. Because we tried to do everything. Um, hey, this against this defense, this play would be strong. Yeah, it would, but what if they have an answer and now what? And, um, you know, we didn't think through. Currently, what we try to do is we're going to run this play. Okay, well, if their answer is this, what's ours back? And m having multiple of those answers for the same play, because then you're running that one play much better. Um, and so uh, that was, it took us a couple years to, I think, find our our, our niche, our base, and, and settle down. And um, it wasn't always the, the you know, hybrid wing T that we called it, uh, which we started in 15. Uh, we were, you know, had some pretty strong teams 2010 um, doing the zone option stuff and RPO stuff before it was known as RPO. Um, and so, uh, but what I learned there again is evolving to what players, um, how they fit your system, but also how can you utilize those those talented players, both sides of the ball, who can make an impact, and then kind of structuring around um, those individuals. So in 2015, we had a, a, a gifted young man who was a wide receiver and certainly a quarterback who could have got him the ball, but um, 
but could he get it to him 13, 15 times? We weren't sure about that. And so one way to do it was to implement jet offense. And so went to clinics, um, went online, did a lot of research, um, wing T ish, but we still had a lot of spread principles. That was our, our history, our roots. And so kind of tweaked and modified what worked for us. But uh, had we not done that, I doubt we would have won the state championship in 15 because we were able to spread the ball out, um, spread the field out, and give the ball. Put and we, we could dictate more how we were going to get the ball in our playmakers' hands. Um, and so what I also like a lot is – doing things that are a little unique. So especially in 15, even though people were shocked, this is the first year you ran the, you know, this offense and how surprised they were. I think what it was was also a big advantage for us. Teams hadn't prepared for it. Um, and so they hadn't seen it and hadn't prepared the year before. Um, so that really gave us uh, an advantage. And I'll tell you, um, when we would watch film and we would prepare, well, how are they going to line up to this formation? We had no idea. Um, that kind of made it fun is the on the game, uh, on the field chess match. But you had to be sound with her, your rules. And our players had to know um, exactly what their responsibilities were. Um, if he lines up inside of you, are, is it a down block? Or if he's outside, are you reaching? Or is it going to be a, a full block? So knowing those things and, and preparing our young men to, you know, to be um, almost coaches, but, you know, player, um, educated players on the field really helped us um, in, you know, 15, 16. Um, so... Um, that gets into the, the, the being unique, doing something different than, than others, uh, makes preparation certainly harder, uh, for opponents, um, like I have there, um, adopt, adapting to your personnel. Um, a big thing that, uh, so Kurt and I, uh, early on when we were hired, we kind of, I think we also thought that, hey, doing this uh, co-head coach is going to allow each of us to take on certain aspects and it'll be less work. Well, that was foolish thinking. We both did uh, equal parts. We we're both equally involved in community service events and, um, you know, um, deal, you know, dealing with parents and communicating with them and all sorts. But um, one thing that we both felt strongly about is, uh, is being involved in our parents' lives. From having cookouts at our house, um, players knew my family um, well. Uh, they knew my kids. They know my wife. Um, you know, a highlight of one of my cookouts that I was having over, guys, um, serving up some hot dogs or something. And I remember um, somebody asking for, one of our, our star athletes, you know, Joe Bocci, goes on to play at, at Central. Um, just a stud, a great kid. And where'd he go? And, you know, I'm like, uh oh, I don't have no idea where this kid is. And then I hear basketball um, dribbling. So I go up, up there and look on the driveway. And uh, there he is playing with my, well, probably then he was probably a six, seven year old son. Um, what what an impact he made on, on my son, right? Being being kind and, and reaching out to the young kid like that, um, is it's just phenomenal. So you also get a, to see what your players are like. Uh, I still, as much as I can to this day, will have players over for dinner. I I feel like you share a meal, you get to know them, and they, it's not about football. It's about you know being. Uh, being a man and, um, you know, seeing, having them be a part of our lives. Um, that to me is what coaching is about. So um, community service, uh, we're very proud. We, uh, while I was there, we were three-time um, Spicer Award winners, which is the community service award. 
I, uh, we did everything with them. It was never a, hey, you guys go to this or that um, and rack up those hours. Coaches were there supervising, often multiple coaches. But I think um, one thing, the I don't want to use the word harder, but um, maybe the more labor intensive the um, community services. And we did uh, Habitat for Humanity one year. For many years, we set up uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of tents for the Susan G. Komen Walk. Um, our youth camp, I thought it really showed the character of a young man. If you see a guy that's over there getting 800 drinks in an hour um, and setting up one tent, kind of shows you uh, what he's going to be like come fall. And so if he's the type where you're telling him, hey, you got to take a break. You don't need to run in between setting up tents or, um, you know, and how they work with youth in the camp. Um, you know, if you got to tell somebody get off his phone because he's there to focus on, on young kids um, in comparison to the one that, you know, is every camper's favorite, that's, it gives you a little insight to what, they're going to be like in the fall for you as well. So, um, you know, highly recommend you know, getting involved in doing those things uh, with the team. So, uh, this was uh, moving to Elma was, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm giggling at my own picture I put up there. Um, I'm very proud to be back. And, and a lot of people ask, what the heck, why, why you wear a kilt? And um, the number one answer is, it's a way for me to externalize my pride of being back at Elma. So um, there I am on the sideline of home games, you know, all kilted up and everything. Um, but coming back to Elma was, was a family decision um, with three boys and my wife who was working, um, I, I wasn't certainly going to do it on my own. And so we made that tough decision um, to come back. And uh, certainly it was difficult. And we do miss many aspects of, of R Romeo from family, friends. Uh, but love every minute of, of coaching. Well, minus a few. Uh, minus those losses. You know, those you never love. But um I think it was the right move, and I've enjoyed uh, working with uh, these men in, in the phase of the life that they're in. So um, one thing that uh, I did right away, uh, the first week I got hired, I uh, met with every single player, and these were 15-minute meetings, and I had one right after another, uh, I didn't drink water. I didn't do anything that would cause me to get off track. And uh, so it was four days straight, a seven hour straight meetings. And uh, I'll be honest, there's a few that <laughs> I don't even remember having them because that's quite a stretch of time. But, but I think they saw that it was important for me to start to get to know them and take the time to, to chat with them. Um, and the other thing was, um, I think the, I, I let my guard down a little bit in my press conference and I spoke from the heart about, um, you know, the thrill of being back at Oma and, and back home. And, and our players saw that. Um, I, I say that, uh, you know, a lot of people ask what's the difference of, coaching high school and college, certainly the speed and tempo and size of players. Uh, but there is the running the business part uh, from budgets and personnels. And, you know, you got to establish a culture, which I think, you know, high schools do as well. Um, those that have invested in your program, which are the alumni, the potential investors in the program, which are the recruits, balancing that. Um, there's something to look up of, um, for me, I, I asked my coaches to, we, one of the early videos I showed coaching staff uh, in you can YouTube, it's called Johnny the Bagger. And uh, it's a great story, um, but basically 
how do we want to treat our young men who play for us? Um, why will, you know, they're not getting scholarships. So other than the love of the game, how can we enhance their experience? And so if you got a few minutes, uh, it's just a couple minute video um, on Johnny the bagger, but um, you know, it's worthwhile. So, um, and then umpteen different committee meetings that I get the privilege of sitting on. That's certainly makes it a little different than, than high school. Um, early, I, I made it important uh, aspect of reconnecting uh, alumni uh, to Alma College and, and um, Jim Cole was uh, detrimental to doing that and helping me. Um, something, some things that I learned um, while coming back is one is I can always continue to learn. Um, I'd be, I, I go in some phases of addiction to uh, some leadership books and podcasts, especially when I'm on the road, audio books, uh, but from Maxwell to John Gordon, um, you know, I love it. And so I can always learn um, and certainly can always learn more, uh, you know, about ball. And uh, I rely heavily on coaching staff around me, um, you know, to learn from them as well. So um, surrounding yourself with, with people you trust, that goes back to talking about Romeo staff and how we are <clears throat> we're together for so long. And we, we just, we knew each other well. We we um, knew the personalities of each other and kind of, you know, helped balance it. Um, I think it took a little bit of time here at Alma because they wanted to get, they needed to know me as much as I needed to get to know them um, as coaches and as people. Um, I also am a big believer, um, it's kind of like uh, when you're young and dating, if you put yourself out there, you're going to get more out of it, but you might, yeah, you might get hurt. Uh, but the stronger relationships are built when you, when you put yourself out there and, and your players will start to trust you. And uh, I think we'll, you know, the saying run through a wall for you. Um, we talk about culture a lot here at Alma. Um, and really more so than even talking about it is living it. And so um, we have what's called kilt style um, culture. One of our coaches uh, came up with this slogan after the first year, um, after her wearing kilt on the sideline, they said, well, we got to do something. We got to play off of kilt. And so, um, Kilt is kinship, integrity, love, and tenacity. Um, and I won't go through each of those with you, what they mean to us, but that's not all of it, right? Um, the base, everything that's being held up, and you can see it in this, this graphic here, is about relationships. Um, that's why we you know, do community service, but that's why the players come over for dinner. That's why the coaching staff goes to the cafeteria uh, as much as we can. It's to sit with them, to, to build a relationship. We don't always and often, we don't talk football. We find out who's dating who and who got dumped and how things are going at home. And um, if a parent is you know, struggling or, or sick, um, that's where we find those. And then we certainly follow up with a more, you know, maybe intimate, like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them and, and see how they're doing. Uh, pride in the plaid is, is just that. Be proud of Elma. Be proud uh, of being a part of it um, and supporting others um, within Elma College. PLP is player-led program. This is what is, this one certainly is continuing to evolve because I think it's not, it didn't happen right away. One, I don't know if I trusted right away. Um, and, but players I know have similar intentions and goals as, as we as coaches have, 
those are the ones that you push them to, hey, this is your program too. Let's, where do you want this to go? And so um, I think once we get to where players are really um, dictating the, the atmosphere that we want, the, the tempos, the whatever it might you know, be, that's when you've got things rolling. And so we're, we're really pushing for our players to take more leadership roles, but we're also trying to give them the tools for it because there's so many resources out there. So, um, and then within our culture, we, um, we also have an offensive and a defensive culture. Uh, we've talked about a special teams one as well, but, uh, you know, from 12 strong of offense, meaning 11 on the field plus that X, X factor of, um, you know, scout team players to, hey, the defense got us the ball back. That's the 12th man. Our crowd, our, um, you know, the coaches. So um, to our defensive side, you know, the effort, attitude, toughness um, culture. So. A uh, lot goes into it, and, um, you know, but it's certainly, you know, I've seen a, a, a movement um, and an expectation now within the program that I'm excited, and it's our, our kids are, are thirsty for it. They want to, they have the desire to, to be successful on Saturdays, but do it the right way um, within the guilt style culture. So. Um, certainly would love to hear from you. Uh, if you have questions, don't ever hesitate to reach out. That's my cell phone there. Um, Twitter, Coach Couch, uh, Alma there. But uh, would love to hear from you and um, would more than, uh, more than happy to sit down and, and talk. Um, a couple of things uh, last mention. Uh, any of our home games, if you'd like to come, uh, I wish uh, you can just kind of go on our website. I wish I would have put the slide up there, but we have four home games. Any of them you're welcome to, uh, but we are having one October 17th. Uh, we're calling it the High School Coaches Appreciation Game, where we'll have uh, some refreshments and things before and after. But any of our games, you're welcome to be there from four hours prior to kickoff or it's pregame meal through our chapel to our Scotsman walk, or you can show up right at kickoff and we'll have some tickets for you. Um, and then after the game on the 17th, we're going to have an area where um, you'll be able to, to talk uh, a little bit more, share some refreshments. And, uh, but we would love to have you up and uh, share the experience. So, Please don't hesitate to reach out for you, your staff, your family, if you'd like to come up for a game. So thank you all. I hope uh, this was a, a little beneficial, helpful, a big thing during this uh, difficult time. Best wishes to you and your family. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. God bless you.